Welcome to Plate Tectonics Part 4. This is the last uh, part of the plate tectonics discussion. And so we've looked at the various boundaries. We've looked at the divergent boundary, the characteristics related to the divergent boundary. We looked at the convergent boundary where we had ocean to continent convergence, ocean to ocean convergence, and uh, continent to continent convergence with the respective landforms that as a result of those interactions of each one of the plate boundaries. And then we looked at the transform boundary where we have uh, one plate sliding or grinding past another plate. And we found that most transform boundaries uh, occur at least 95% of the time into the, out in the ocean floor. There are only two places on earth where a transform boundary exists on the continents. Uh, one area is the San Andreas Fault in California and the Alpine Fault located in New Zealand. This slide that you're looking at here is a continuation of the Transform Fault or the San Andreas Fault. And this is a picture of um, a little city in California called Parkfield. And Parkfield has a population of about 18. And it's a great little trip um, to... Um, to take from Bakersfield, it's about 100 miles from Bakersfield. You travel west on Highway 46 uh, towards Pass Robles and just before the James Dean Memorial, approximately a mile before the James Dean Memorial, you can uh, make a um, right turn head north for about 15 miles on a little highway and it'll take you up to Parkfield. And again, Parkfield is a population of 18, but what's significant about Parkfield and it is situated right on the San Andreas Fault. This particular slide you're looking at here is the bridge that heads into Parkfield. And this bridge happens to lie right above or right on top of the San Andreas Fault. And so um, right below the bridge is a little creek uh, down here in which the creek follows the San Andreas Fault. What's significant is if you walk along this bridge, and since the bridge uh, lies perpendicular to the fault, you can see where the bridge has been slowly tweaked and slowly bent as the fault uh, creeps and the fault makes its move. And so typically on a field trip that we take to the San Andreas Fault, uh, our last stop is usually this stop right here where I have the students walk across the bridge. And again, they can notice the, uh, the bending uh, of the bridge as a result of the San Andreas Fault. And you'll see a sign right here. It says San Andreas Fault entering the North American plate. And if you are on the other side of the bridge, right where my arrow is, uh, you would see another sign that says San Andreas Fault entering the Pacific plate. This person here in the photograph, uh, I have no idea who that is. So I put uh, the cartoon picture of Paul McCartney's face on there. Well, this brings us to the last part of the discussion in which we're going to try and answer the question uh, that Alfred Wegener could not answer back in uh, the mid 1920s. And that is how do the plates in fact move? And we're gonna use the concept of convection. And if we think about convection and we define convection, convection is a process in which heat is transferred either through a liquid or a gas. And this typically results in circular movement of particles. And we can say circular movement of particles because the molecules um, basically are move around both in a solid and a liquid. If you recall, we use the word conduction to describe heat transfer through a solid. So again, convection is heat transfer through a liquid or a gas resulting in a circular movement of particles. A good example of convection would be using uh, this diagram down here that shows a cutaway of a, of a pot. And in this pot, and let's say for the purposes, it's a clear pot, uh, we can put the water in this pot. We begin to heat the water. And if you notice at the bottom of the, of the pot is where the heat is going to start heating the uh, water first. And so as the water begins to heat at the bottom of the pot, the particles become very active. And as the particles become active, they want to start moving up uh, towards the top of the, of the water uh, because the particles are less dense, more active, they move towards the top, 
Then as they move away from the heat source, they cool, become more dense, and then the particles begin to fall back down and they get heated up again and then and then go to the top and fall back down, thus creating the circular movement of particles. And where one can really see convection is, if, again, if you get this pot of water in a see-through pot, you can begin to boil the water and just put uh, oatmeal flakes in there, and you would actually see the oatmeal flakes kind of mimic uh, the circular movement of the convection cell. So we're going to take this concept of convection and we're going to apply it to the Earth's interior, to the Earth's mantle, uh, to see if we can come up with, with a way to uh, move the plates. This picture here is an example of convection, where again, the uh, particles on the bottom have been heated, the particles begin to rise. Um, as the particles rise, they move away again, away from the heat source and fall back down, and then are heated again, again, creating this nice convection loop. So we're gonna take convection now and we're gonna apply it uh, to the Earth's interior. And so remember that the Earth's interior is composed of an uh, iron solid core, a liquid outer core, the mantle, xenosphere, and then lithosphere. So if we go down where my arrow is to the core, we know that the core is very hot. And so this is a, now a chance for the hot core to heat up material in the mantle, the bottom part of the mantle, uh, if we apply convection, then that uh, heated uh, material from the bottom of the mantle will begin to rise. As it rises, it moves away from the heat source and the material begins to cool. And as it cools, it becomes more dense and then it'll have a tendency to move and fall back down uh, into the uh, core. And as the material is falling back down uh, towards the core, it'll have a tendency to cling on or grab the uh, rigid plate material and begin to drag it and pull it along. And this is known as slab pull. So slab pull again is known, is, is, is um, uh, defined by the uh, rigid plate being uh, pulled ba back down and slide across the asthenosphere. So this is a, a great hypothesis in terms of how uh, convection would work to uh, move the plates. However, when you look at this particular uh, picture, uh, it paints a really nice graphical view that the uh, convection cells uh, within the mantle are very large and very uniform. And in actuality, Mother Nature didn't write the book. And uh, so convection probably most likely does take place uh, in the, um, in the mantle, but it's not these really nice, beautiful convection cells, but instead it may occur as what I like to call blobs, blobs within the, uh, within the mantle. So for example, in this particular slide, we're gonna take a look at the lithosphere at the very top of this example. And you can see uh, Africa here, South America there, Australia and so forth. And then here would be the interior parts of the earth or the mantle in this case. And instead of these nice, beautiful convection cells, what we really are looking at are blobs um, of shrinking and swelling magma plumes uh, that rise. And as they rise uh, towards the top of the lithosphere, uh, they'll come back down. And as they move back down, uh, they'll drag the lithospheric material with it. And so what this really resembles and looks like is a lava lamp. And back in the days uh, when I was growing up, um, lava lamps were pretty popular. And so you would plug the lava lamp in and the waxy material in the lava lamp would begin to warm, creating these um, plumes of wax that would begin to rise up the lava lamp. And then when it gets away from its heat source, um, it sinks back down. Then as it sinks back down, it starts all over again. And so my guess is that the interior of the earth, again, looks more like a lava lamp activity as opposed to those nice, uh, concentric, beautiful convection cells that I showed earlier. So is there evidence for this kind of activity in the uh, mantle uh, creating this uh, lava lamp-like um, activity? And the answer is yes. And 
if we look, take a look at this last slide here, it shows um, a map view of the ocean floor and the current configuration of the continents. So you see uh, Africa here, Asia there, um, United States, South America there. And then you'll see the ocean floor. And if you notice, the ocean floor is very colored. And each one of these colors on the ocean floor represents the speed or the velocity or rate of plate movement. So let me repeat that. The colors on the ocean floor um, represents uh, the rate of how the plates are moving or the speed or velocity of the plates. And as you can see on this ocean floor, the colors aren't as uniform as one would expect if it was a nice, concentric, beautiful convection uh, current. So in fact, the ocean floor gives rise to evidence that more than likely the um, magma plumes that are rising again, are more like a, a lava lamp because, it, because as they come in contact with the lithosphere, they're at different velocities and so forth. The other interesting um, take, take away for this, for this uh, particular diagram is the fact that the continents are not colored. In fact, the continents are showing nothing. And this gives evidence or shows that within the plate tectonic model, as we discussed, the continents go along for the ride. So really what's going on here is if we backtrack a hundred years ago to Alfred Wagner and he couldn't uh, answer why uh, the plates are moving, it's directly related to the fact that the scientists at that time didn't really understand the activity uh, on the ocean floor. And now today uh, we know that the ocean floor is more active with volcanism and more active with earthquakes than anywhere on the continents. And as we said earlier, uh, the continents are boring, which is kind of good for us. So wouldn't it have been great for Alpha Wegener to be able to, at his hand, have available these slides and the evidence of the seafloor and how active it is and the evidence of the rate of movement and the rate of seafloor spreading? And wouldn't it have been great to be able to present that back in the 1920s and uh, maybe he wouldn't have been uh, presented with such a hostile criticism and reaction to his continental drift. But I think that if Alpha Wegener were to present um, all of the data that we talked about uh, today uh, in these different parts of the plate tectonics discussion, I think that the science folks would say, wow, Alfred, where the heck did you get that computer? And where did you get the camera? And how does all that work? That's probably to be more concerned with.